You're listening to a resource from Jamboree Anglican Church. There are how many questions have I got? One, two, three, four. Four questions. Here's the first one. Was it sexist that Jewish women were made to worship further away than men in the temple? Well, uh, if you want to know the context of this, you should have a listen to last week's talk. But the, uh, what I did point out was that in the Old Testament and in the New, uh, there's actually, there is a differentiation between men and women. Uh, just as a bit of an aside, our society has done its very best to try and remove any difference whatsoever between men and women. And it just seems to be continuing more and more. Uh, to the point where people are saying, listen, let's get rid of gender completely. It'd be so much easier that way, so they say. Uh, which is, well, it's problematic in a few ways, especially if you happen to be an elite sportswoman and then somebody who is a male then competes against you and is allowed to do so because gender is just a construct. Uh, that doesn't really seem to work so well. Anyway, I digress. Uh, God made men and women different and uh, made us with special differences between our genders. And these differences are to be embraced and to be enjoyed. We, we shouldn't blush about them at all. Historically, Jews would have made, had men and women separated in their worship. And uh, when Mandy and I went to the Wailing Wall at Jerusalem, uh, I went towards it and Mandy went towards it and I said, bye, see you in a little while. And I put my little skull cap on and went to the men's bit and then she went on the other side of the fence to the women's bit. And they've continued that little ritual on to this day. But what about for Christians? Well, in the New Testament, there are different roles for men and women in the church and in the home. And uh, we're going to see more about that in a few weeks time when we get to that bit in Ephesians. But with this, we need to realize that just because there's a difference in role, it doesn't mean that there's a difference in worth or in value. Uh, it's often said that we believe that men and women are equal, but are different. And I think that's a pretty handy slogan to sort of summarize it. Now, to answer the question, because I, I could have just finished there and dodged it, but no, not quite. Uh, if you believe that men and women need to have identical roles in absolutely every area of life, then you might look and see what happened there at the temple and say that's sexist. But if you did that, then I think you'd probably end up having to say that professional sports teams were sexist when they excluded women from playing for the male Australian cricket team and so on. I think that we generally realise that it's fine to treat men and women differently in some situations. And if you agree that the teaching from the Bible is right when it says that women and men are wonderfully made by God to have different roles in the family and in the church, then you will say that it's a beautiful expression of God's creation. And if you disagree with that, you'll probably call it sexist. And I guess that's where we'll have to disagree. Question two. Is it okay for a Christian not to want children? Well, I'm not sure there's a definitive answer on this question. And I realise also that it's pretty sensitive and it could be quite personal. But you've asked me, so here are my thoughts. Uh, in the Bible, there's a good argument for saying that people should consider remaining single and unmarried because it means that people can be less distracted than those who are married. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, Paul says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. And he mounts an argument for why there's a real benefit in being single in terms of your devotion to God. But if you've made the decision to be married, then I take that it is normal and right to have children if you are able to do so. Uh, this is only really a relatively new issue. Uh, since the invention of, the, uh, of oral contraception and other modern contraceptions um, that sort of coincided with the sexual revolution, uh, before that there was a very clear link between sex and babies. And once you can break that link and say you can have sex without babies, you then need to have this ethical question, which has come up now more recently. But I think that because sex and babies and marriage and sex is connected, I think that's the normal and natural way to go. 
and that it is a normal thing for a Christian who is married to want to go down the path of having children if they've decided to get married and if they can. That is a huge investment and it's also a massive ministry. But I think that that, we can certainly say the blessings are enormous and are profound. Second last question. What is the thorn in Paul's flesh? Well, someone's asked this question uh, from this particular passage. It's a bit of a doozy. It says, So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. What's the thorn? We don't know. We really don't know what the thorn is. It's clearly something we can see from that, that it causes him pain and stops him being proud. So what is it? Some people say that it might be a disability of some sort. Uh, In Galatians chapter 4, it talks a bit about something that sounds maybe like an eye problem of sorts. Uh, Maybe it was something that broke in his body when he kept on getting beaten up for following Jesus. Remember, he got absolutely flogged almost to death. Maybe he had a mental health issue. Maybe he battled with anxiety and depression or something like that. We, we just don't know. And as I read somewhere during the week, it's not necessarily a bad thing because whatever that thorn is, we can know that it's something that's really, it's really hammered him in a lot of ways. And it could be the same thing that you struggle with or that I struggle with. Who knows? But it does show that I think that any... Any version of Christianity that says that if you're a keen follower of Jesus, then life is going to be easy, I'd say, so what does that make the Apostle Paul? Was he a little bit weak in his faith because he had this thorn in his side? Maybe he was just, he didn't really trust in Jesus much. And I think I'd say, no, that's not the case at all. If you're going through a hard time, then we don't understand exactly why. But for you, like the Apostle Paul, it may well be that it's causing you to, to be tormented. It may well be that through this it is causing you to focus on Jesus and not be proud. But whatever it is, I think that's we don't know the answer. And that's my best guess. Finally... If a friend discriminates against me because I'm a Christian, then how do I ask them to stop without making a big deal and without losing their friendship? Well, following on from Paul's thorn in his side, it's important we remember that when you follow Jesus, it's going to be hard. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if you signed up for following Jesus thinking that this is your ticket to to a nice life, uh, then maybe check if you kept the receipt because that is not what comes when you follow Jesus. We should expect to be persecuted. We should expect to have people reject us. We should expect to be teased because we follow Jesus. So what should we do? What should we do when that happens, especially when it's a friend? Well, don't fight back. Matthew 5.39, Jesus said, I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Uh, As Colin Buchanan sang in one of his songs, it's not so so weak to turn the other cheek. (laughs) Uh, I think that's right. Uh, If you're a follower of Jesus and you're at school or at work, at home or wherever it is in your family, uh, it is likely that those who don't know Jesus will think that there's something stupid about you and what you're doing. And don't take it personally because realize they did it to Jesus. John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. And since they persecuted me, Jesus, naturally they'll persecute you. And if they listen to me, they would listen to you. Let me pray. Father, when we go through hard times, when we are persecuted, we ask that you would help us to turn the other cheek and to consider it pure joy when we suffer trials of many kinds, knowing that 
that they persecuted Jesus in the same way. We pray, Lord, that those who are strong against Jesus and against his followers might eventually weaken and see the beauty of following Jesus and, like us, find hope and certainty in him. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from Jembrew Anglican Church. For more information, head to jembrewanglican.com.